Chance podcast, and what a treat we have for you on this episode. Forrest Gump, the movie you may or may not have seen, is where Forrest just kept running and collected an army of fans along the way. Well, here we have the runner who actually did the route, Rob Pope, completing 15,700 miles over 422 days in 2016. Having achieved so much more since, Rob still does not appear to be slowing down. So let's find out how Rob's running tail began and what he has planned ahead. Over to you, Rob. <laughs> I guess it sort of started a long time ago when I was at school. Um, you know, sort of a bit of a on the on the fields of Liverpool and the Wirral in the mud in the winter, wearing a very sort of skimpy running vest. You know, sort of a. I'm pretty sure in these in these days that's actually counted as child cruelty, but they called it cross country then. Um, and so I, I didn't really take it very seriously. Um, I was always like decent at, at running, but you know, so I wasn't really one for training very hard. And so when I went to uni, I didn't really bother doing much running, but I would tend to do the London Marathon most years. Um, and I you know, trained to do about 40 miles a week when I was doing that. Uh, it's only really when I went to Australia and I didn't really sort of think I was going to be the best candidate for playing Aussie rules football that I took, uh, well, joined an athletics club and, yeah, seemed to get, you know, a lot better because, you know, training didn't seem like such hard work anymore. And, um, yeah, so I became Australian marathon champion uh, in the final year when I was living yeah. there. Yeah, and then, <laughs> what, was that, what was that feeling like when you won like a first major marathon? Yeah, what was Technically, that? I only came tenth. But everybody in front of me was a uh, Kenyan or Japanese, and so. Um, I did confess as I went over the finish line that technically I wasn't Australian, but I've been there long enough to qualify. So, uh, you know, <laughs> I wasn't going to argue beyond that. You know, if I, I knew I was running for the state of Victoria. Um, and to be honest, if they picked me for that, then I wasn't going to pr protest too much, especially when I had a nice gold medal in my back pocket. Yeah. Was you, was you a bit upset that it wasn't for the UK and that it was for Australia to win something that big? No, not at all. I, I, I love being in Australia now. So I still sort of wonder if I'll ever go back, you know. And so I sort of feel that maybe I should go back and just become Australian so the story actually makes more sense. Yeah. But um, I ended up, a very long story as well, you know. So I ended up becoming Oregon State champion uh, in the 10K on my, uh, on my run across the States as well. So I've got a habit of being a little bit of a running cuckoo, turning up to all these places and nicking a medal and then sodding off somewhere else. So then tell us how Forrest Gump, The Root, happens. Obviously, you watched the movie and thought, no one's done it, I'm going to do it. Or was it someone bet gave you a bet or what? I, I wanted to run across America for years, like sort of way before I went to Australia. And, you know, when you're thinking about ways to run across, everybody sort of thinks, you know, if you say you're running across America, the natural response of a lot of people is like Forrest Gump. And so I knew the group really procrastinate and I like to sort of, instead of doing useful things, I like to like Google stuff like what route did Forrest take. And so I knew quite a lot about it, but of course it's a you know ridiculous distance. And, you know, I still think even to this day, nobody's ever done a, continuous run in the same country that's as far as that so you know it's it's natural that you don't you know sort of have it at the top of your to-do list uh, and I know he ran across Australia this stroller that I used to go across a big chunk of the states I bought in Australia and it was designed for that purpose but you know as happens so often with life that just didn't transpire so it was only when I moved back to the UK in circumstances with work sort of opened up you know I, I quit um, he was there, it was now or never and um, somebody had already ran uh, the second leg of the route which is from Santa Monica to Maine uh, and I figured well seeing as I sort of got it into my head that I was going to attempt it if one person had done one leg it was only a matter of time before somebody else did the whole thing and so it was time to go So you grew the beard, you grew the hair 
you wore a similar outfit. You know, what was it like when you was running the route? Did you build up an army like Forrest did or was it on your own most of the time? Only online. <laughs> Only online. I got a few people that would uh, that would follow me along the run, but like, so it, it wasn't ever sort of a, uh, a troop, which is good. Because seeing as I was like funding it myself, I didn't really fancy buying everybody dinner and a gang of 40 following behind me, you know. Um, like the, eventually when we got to the finish, it was very similar to the final scene. We had we had sort of, in fact, we probably had more people there than Forrest did at the end. Um, and sort of, you know, including a lot of people who were very important to me. So that was pretty cool. You know, if I was going to be following me, that was going to be it. And did, so did you have like a team, like someone in the car? Because obviously you weren't going A to Z and back to A again. You was literally just continuing. So someone had to carry all your luggage, your food and water. How, how, how much planning went into it? Uh, I had two teams, uh, but you couldn't really call either of them a team. Uh, the first one sort of was my girlfriend, uh, now my wife, Nadine, um, who we basically bought an old camper van and sort of uh, she was in that. But, you know, barring the odd uh, welcome cameo, cameo appearance from a friend or two, um, she did all that sort of uh, heavy lifting herself. Uh, and the second team was Pram Solo, the stroller that I bought in Australia. And then, sort of, you know, it was our job to carry everything. Oh, no. <laughs> She's like weightlifting. <laughs> it's it's not, nothing to be sad about. <laughs> yeah. So did you actually do like, you know, the foot in the ocean one end, foot in the, you know, other foot in the other end? Yeah, exactly. Like sort of, uh, if you if you're running across a continent, as far as I'm concerned, it doesn't count if you get in the water. That was an advice passed on to me by a by a chap called Chris Finnell. Um, he's he's quite famous actually. He's one of the very few people who's ran every London Marathon, the fortieth and his fortieth, of course. Uh, and he'd run across the Sorry, sorry Rob, where did you say you, it just cut off? It said he ran every. What did he run every? Yeah, so Chris has ran every London Marathon that there's ever been, you know, sort of, and so he's recently just completed his 40th and, of course, you know, the 40th edition of the race. Um, and he'd run across the States before and he made sure, he said, it only counts if you get in the water afterwards. So uh, I didn't actually start at the ocean, but I made sure that within a day or two I'd got to the ocean so I could get my feet in the Atlantic to start with so it would it would count as a crossing. And um, then, of course, I'd, I'd hit the Pacific, then the Atlantic, then the Pacific, then the Atlantic for, you know, <laughs> a good few times. And I've actually got a little amulet that I made so that contains some of the water from the first dip in the Atlantic and the, uh, the first dip in the Pacific as well. So I carried that with me the whole way. Wow, that's a good idea as well. And like... Oh, I just don't know how you did it because I'm just like thinking. Four, you went four times, didn't you, across America? Yeah, di distance-wise, they they count the 2,766 miles, which is the I think the shortest distance from LA to New York. So distance-wise, I actually went across six times, pretty much. But um, it was geographically uh, about four and three quarters because, of course you know, Forrest doesn't finish at an ocean, he finishes in the middle of nowhere, which is where I ended up. So, like, 422 days, did you run every day? There were no, like, deliberate rest days, like, I wasn't, like, taking a rest day. Unfortunately, some of them were forced on us, like, say, for example, um, like, when the RV broke down and we literally had to get it fixed, you know, you can't do anything about that. Um, and then I lost um, four days to injury where I like just physically couldn't do anything and uh, five days to food poisoning. Uh, but beyond that, that was it. So did you do any training other than you was a marathon runner? Did you do any training building up? I know it's 
really a silly question. How can you really prepare for the my, that sort of mileage, you know, in over a year? Oh, um, you know, so, like, yeah. Like I didn't, I didn't do any training at all, really. Um, I, I, I can now look back on it and pretend I was being really cool and go, "Oh, well, Forrest didn't train; he just put his shoes on and he went." But uh, it was just because I just didn't really think it through, and <laughs> and I was probably running about, you know, you know, there's a lot of like runners who will do 20, 30, 40 miles a week as just their random sort of, you know, training or keeping fit regime. And that's what I was doing. I wasn't increasing any distance. You know, I just figured I'd work it out on the way. And um, if I had my time again, I wouldn't do any more running training, but I would definitely have made sure that I was a lot more flexible and that my core was a lot stronger because that did come back to haunt me a few times. Did it? I was going to say, what sort of injuries did you have along the way? Uh, well, I got the blister that you would have a couple of weeks but once you know they've gone that was it really um i got uh tendonitis in my anterior tibialis muscle about 500 miles in and um, i got so i didn't you know take any days off with that i managed to get through it with uh you know still a little bit of walking alterate altering my pace i uh, saw a really cool uh, physio uh, in houston called whitney uh, that is not a fabrication and um i then went on to phoenix uh, where i got started getting a bit of one of the nightmare injuries that runners fear um, and I just taped and got on with that. Um, I tore my quad uh, in between Arkansas and, uh, and Memphis, Tennessee. Um, and so that was one of the days where I ended up having two days off with that and then started walking after two days. Um, then what was next? I started just getting niggles then. Everything was tightening up in my pelvis. And so I would get like sort of a pelvic pain pain and such I would like try and sort of you know I'd be fighting fires with stretching and rolling and you know using those massage balls but I would never I would never generally be completely pain free but you know it wasn't so you say you know I was always in pain but it didn't mean every day was miserable you know it's sort of yeah. you, you, you agree to just be able to get through it. So like have you had any lasting effects on your body? You know, like yeah, you know. I think so. Um, like sort of, I definitely am a lot tighter, and sort of, um, I've got injured quite a bit when I came back. Um, just trying to run fast again, uh, just because I think obviously to really run fast, it's the combination of cadence, i.e., the amount of steps you can take a minute, and uh, your running stride. So, um, not being very tall anyway, I was always a fairly high cadence runner, but. I, you know, I didn't have a really restricted stride, but when I came back and I, it was restricted further, I was causing quite a bit of trouble, but like with the sort of help of like sort of yoga and some, like, I'm getting back there now, like in terms of thing to the point where, you know, sort of I'm thinking, I'm associated a lot with sort of ultra running at the moment, but I wouldn't mind going back to do a couple of quick marathons just because I'm getting older and I'd all, all, almost like the opportunity to train really hard for a, you know, a 42 K and just see, you know, basically at the start line, knowing that I've trained as well as I physically could get whatever time I get. And if I PB fantastic, that would be amazing. But if I don't, I'm actually quite cool with that because it would allow me to embrace the concept of aging and just go, well, cool. So I am 42 this year, and so I'm calling the whole thing Project 42. Um, and so I'm going to try and see if I can, um, yeah, sort of beat my PB in a marathon, and, you know, we'll see where that takes me. So We'll talk about your PBs, but one more question I want to relate to the America one. I have to ask, how many pairs of trainers did you go through? I went through 33 uh, in total. <laughs> and and sort of I'm one, one pair of uh, Cortez as well, because, you know, that, that that's the reason why I was the person to do this gun prom, because somebody may have done it and not really embraced it, but there was no way I was never going to, 
shave all my hair off at the start and then not get it done, including the beard until the end. So, you know, there's a, um, I think there's a quote in the Big Lebowski, isn't it? It's like, sometimes there's a dude and yeah, I think I was the dude for it. <laughs> <laughs> so what was your best experience during the, I know I said the trainers was the last question, but you must have seen some sights like, I know you're into wildlife, you are into nature. You must have seen some amazing, you know, sights when you went across. What was the one that really stood out to you? Uh, God, like, so, uh, maybe the most beautiful place sort of I, I saw in a, like a real breathtaking way was uh, Glacier National Park. And, uh, you know, named for the glaciers, but by 2030, there will be no glaciers. So it was, you know, it was sort of tragically beautiful in a way. Uh, but, you know, my favourite photo of the run is probably still there. It's me running like still with uh, Nadine took the photo with a lovely, like, mountainous backdrop in, in um, sort of, you know, late summer. And so that was fantastic. Uh, and generally, though, like, so I just love being in the desert. I, I remember like sort of the day where I sort of cle uh, left California for the for the final time, and like Lake Tahoe, which I just left from, um, was one of the places I really wanted to see. Um, you know, sort of all, uh, yeah, it's it's every bit as beautiful as Glacier. Um, but then when I ascended out of that valley over the hills and dropped down into Nevada and saw the desert in front of me, like the excitement was just unbelievable you know so i really came alive like when that happened and um yeah so wow. time spent in the desert joshua tree national parks unbelievable oh so moving on you do like the heat i personally am no good with the heat i i am a marathon runner and the marathons i've done i've moaned like hell when it's been boiling hot but you last year have done a race I would love to do, but never done. And that was the ultra marathon in the Sahara Desert. How was it? Cause it just looked amazing when I've watched it on YouTube. I've followed runners that I know from following on Facebook. What was it like? Was it your first time last year? Yeah. Yeah, I think in... <sighs> When would it have been? It would have been 2000, I think. And um, I was about two months away from um, you know, the start line when I did my longest ever run at that point. Um, it was like, so I'm on a treadmill in the gym. Like, I can go on a treadmill for hours. It's as if I really like it. Maybe it's sort of uh, prepared me for those long desert roads. And uh, I felt great. I had a big pack on my back. And then the next day, I went out for another run and ran up a hill trying to catch this guy and tore my hip flexor. So, and, you know, another 18 years before I would uh, get to that start line. So it was a long time coming. And it's just brilliant. Like from the journey where you all go out there together, it turned out we were on our bus. We were sitting four rows in front of like, the elite Moroccans that would win the race. And um, a guy who was in our little group asked, asked this chap, uh, had he run the race before? Cue hysterics from the Moroccans when they said he's won it for the last six years, you know. <laughs> but, but we, we can't be really... those guys. Camaraderie there is brilliant. Like one of our tent guys was having a really bad day and he was like limping his way from the finish line back to the tent uh, on one of the stages. And like sort of the guys who were in the elite's tent just came and carried his water and brought it in for him. So it just like there's no like sort of them and us there um and the, the one thing is it calls itself the hardest race on earth which a lot of people have sort of poured a bit of cold water on because they're saying it's not hard because you can get like sort of you know eight, which i think is a is a rough discrimination anyway but the thing is it's a bit like circuit training uh, because it's as hard as you make it and it's harder for different reasons. You know, if you go do circuits in the gym, you wouldn't be able to tell, judging by the expressions on faces, who was fit and who wasn't at the end of it, you know, because if you really push hard, everybody comes out of it as knackered as one or another. And if you run really fast in the MDS, you know, your quads are shot, you're nutritionally struggling to get by. But if you take your time there, you get cooked. 
And so it's a different ordeal depending on sort of, you know, how far, you know, so how fast you want, you want to push during the race. And so anybody, I think, who does a lot of running, uh, or even anybody who does a lot of trekking could complete it. Um, but by doing it slowly, don't think you're going to get an easy ride. <laughs> I know, but with the marathon de sables, like how hot does it get during the day? It it just looks unbearable, you know. You know, going at the top of those sand. I think, yeah, I think we were fairly lucky. I I think the hottest we got was like sort of a, like thirty eight, um, but we didn't get it for as long as some of the times we had it quite windy, um, you know, which sort of. Um, dries you out a bit more um and it does get really really hot but you you really adjust to it like sort of quite quickly you do start sort of in the morning the worst things actually was later in the week when if you were in the top 50 you would start three hours after everybody and then so that would be like a midday start and i know i know the one we woke up in the morning and we saw clouds above the start line it was that was a real blessing <laughs> <laughs> oh you cut out where are you <laughs> but they didn't stick around for long oh you cut oh, out yeah. <laughs> you, cut, you said you saw clouds oh, it, says, Sorry, it cut out you said you saw yeah, uh, it says am i still here my back I'm going to move because you're cutting out. Oh no. Yes, you said you saw clouds and then it just cut out. I'll try again back in here. You can do, you can do that question again. That's cool. Am I still good? So you went, I, I heard clearly you said like if you were ahead, you had to wait like in the top 50, you had, you had to be like three hours. You had to wait three hours and let everyone else go. Is that <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll run that bit from the start so it's easier for your editing. <laughs> so um, yeah, later in the week, if you're in the top fifty, uh, you would have to start three hours after everybody else. They were the long stages, and so you would quite often. But you know, I think it was a midday start, and the glorious start line was replaced literally just by a line in the sand, which made it like sort of feel really hardcore. Uh, uh, with them in our tents, you know, getting packed down around us. Um, when we saw clouds above the start line, that was like an absolute blessing, but they didn't stick around for long. And, uh, you knew you were heading for the whole day in the sun. Oh, so like, you have to carry everything, don't you? You have to carry your backpack, you have to carry your food, your water, any clothing that you need. Did you feel the weight? Oh. I'd done a bit of training with a weight pack before and generally it didn't really bother me. Like sort of um, I think, you know, sort of even though I'm small and I actually I, I look really thin if you look at me, but I'm 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 reasonably sort of stocky. I've got like sort of weird twig like arms and legs, but a fairly stocky upper body and so I don't think sort of the putting that weight on my back was as much of a problem for a lot of people. Um you know, they, you don't have to carry all your water for the week, which is fortunate. They do replenish it and uh, at these checkpoints. And I was just awful at the checkpoints. Just being a novice, you'd see the uh, real elite guys come in. Now, of course, um, somehow I'd managed to find myself up at the front. And I think I was winning at, for some point on the first day, which is good. I'll be able to say I was winning the MDS at, at one point, even though it will never feature in the history books. Um <laughs> And I get into the checkpoints uh, about a minute ahead of these elite guys. And then I wasn't resting at all. I was literally trying to get as much water on me as possible and sort of do these things. And then they'd just literally be off. And I'd be like, how are you doing this? You know, so um, I learned, I think, some tricks. I think next time I'm, I might not take my own water bottles and I might just literally grab the water bottles that they give you and use that that makes sense there we go thinking always thinking <laughs> i watched it i was watching it a couple of years ago when the japanese guy did it and he finished last yeah. he had the whole japanese outfit and like um i don't know what you call the japanese shoes you know the old traditional flip I, I know. yeah they're, they're, they're hardly uh they're hardly nike wild horse are they <laughs> 
did it. And he wasn't a young chap either. I was just like, you, you say like anyone. Yeah. But um, in some sense, yeah, watching him, because I was, I was glued to the marathon just because I was like, is he going to do it? And he did. But yeah. like myself, the heat is just no way. It's just too hot. But leading on, well, that's the thing. have you done yeah. it? Have you done the comrades? In South no, America? not yet. And it was a real shame because I was thinking about doing it this year and uh, it was actually going to be on my birthday, which would have been brilliant. But, um, you know, so I've, I've got my eye on um, you know, there's certain medal categories in the comrades and I do have my eye on sort of uh, one of them. I, I ain't going to win that. Like, so it's, a trapped in a, it's trapped in too many ninjas, but um, I would like to get, get myself a gold medal, you know, sort of in that, which I think is to do it under eight hours. Um, and I, well, yeah, uh, yeah, there's three levels. I should be doors. able to, like, well, mm, but even, even just finishing the comrades is, yeah, so, some, love, something, yeah. something to charge you. I you did it. Comrades. I, I have never done the comrades, but it's one of my favorite races to watch. I, I yeah. spent the whole 12 hours watching it because I cannot believe that, like you say, the ninjas, the fast runners that do it in like six hours. But for me, it's the 12th hour when you've got those runners with one foot over the line and the other foot, you know, the other side and they told, doesn't count. Both feet. I, I couldn't watch that. I, I, I turn off after eleven fifty. I'm too sensitive, like so. I just, I just don't, I just don't need that level of like cruelty in my life. So you know, uh, I do have a friend actually. He's, he's since completed it a couple of times, but um, he, the first time he did the comrades, he was a near miss. He wasn't quite getting bounced back up, you know, as he as he saw the line. But you know, it was only a couple of minutes uh, away from the cut off. Um, and so it is a bit rough. I really wish that they had one more category medal, you know. <laughs> so please, I, I really hope that you do do it because it would be just great to have a British guy do it and get up there within the gold medal because it's just such a hard race. Such a yeah, hard race. Yeah. I reckon, I reckon Tom Evans would do a pre pretty decent stab at it, you know, so maybe I could slipstream him for a bit because I think he's bigger than me. You know, whether, I don't know if I can hold on to him for the whole race, but I'll certainly be able to do it for halfway, I reckon. Oh, but you, you seem like, in a polite way, an absolute bonkers of a guy. So I <laughs> want to know, and I'm sure listeners want to know, have you ever considered doing the Barclay Marathon the weird thing is, I actually hadn't uh, for a while, like sort of, um, but sort of it's, I think as you delve more into the ultra thing, you know, I'd, I'd sort of realised I'd quite like to do the Bartley maybe before I saw the Netflix documentary. Um, then you see the Netflix documentary and then you're thinking, I'm not so sure. Um, but I'd actually like to go and do a couple of the other races that Laz does in Tennessee. Um, you know, so if, uh, if I did the Barclay one day, that'd be fantastic. But they've got a race called the Vaughn State. And um, of all the states I ran in in America, I, I don't think I could ever say I had a favorite state, but Tennessee was so special for me. Um, that was the state that made me think that, hang on, if I was self-supported in this run, you know, just me and Pram Solo, it was the first state I was on my own. And I didn't think I'd be able to handle it. And if it wasn't for the people in Tennessee, uh, because they were just incredible, uh, I, you know, I probably would have quit at Maine. Um, and to run across Tennessee in a race uh, would be great. And that's a hot one as well. That's a hot and sweaty one. <laughs> Um, but yeah, the Barkley Bar Bar would be cool. I've, I've met John Kelly before and like sort of, you know, he doesn't look clinically insane. And so if normal people like that can do it, I'll say normal, he's still, he's got, he's obviously a little bit bonkers, like, you know, but he's, uh, he's relatively normal. And maybe if he can come out of that unscathed and still smile, maybe I could. I, I do. I just think that knowing about you, the type of runs and your mentality, I just think you're a good hopeful for Great Britain to, you know, get us on that map and be one of the very few to do 
through all five of the marathons. It's just, it's an absolute bonkers race. And I just love it. It's just a crazy race. It's, for anyone that yeah. has not watched the Barclay Marathons on Netflix, please do. It, you've just, even the way Laz starts the race by lighting a cigarette, from beginning to end, it's just crazy, isn't it? It's just... I think it's a sort of race that might actually make you take up smoking by the end. <laughs> but um, I, I will always have a, a slight niche bit of history about with Barclay, whether I do it or not. Um, in that I'm pretty certain I'm the only person who's ever run from Badwater to Barclay. And uh, I was due to actually be crewing Josh Stevens in Badwater this year. So uh, that would have been good to have taken a little look. Um, but I was um, camping at the at basically outside a, a bar in, t in, in a place called Petros in Tennessee. Uh, they had a little campsite outside. That was my excuse uh, for going into the bar. <laughs> Obviously, I didn't do that anywhere else on the whole run. And one of the locals said to me, um, they said, are you going up Ratjaw? And I just like, I knew what Ratjaw was. It's one of the famous hills in the Barclay. And I just went to him like, Ratjaw? And he went, yeah, mate, just just outside. And so, like, he, we went out the bar and he just pointed up the hill and I saw that characteristic vista of the, you know, the pylons having had that uh, passage carved through the trees. But, of course, yeah. that passage has since been reclaimed by the briars that like to make such a mess of people's legs. And um, and so I told him that in no, no uncertain terms that pushing a stroller, I would not be going up rat jaw. <laughs> Maybe if I did it, if, if I did a lap of the Barclay with a stroller, that would count as a full one. Yeah, true, true. <laughs> so you were saying earlier that you want to get back to marathons. And obviously yeah. you're well known at the Liverpool Rock and Roll Marathon. I did the half a couple of years ago, so I know the, I know the part of the route and I love the Penny Lane bit where they blast the speakers with the Beatles. Yeah. Is that one of the marathons you're thinking of going back and thinking, yeah, I'm going to break a record there? I will do Liverpool, but I sort of, um, I sort of, it seems strange saying this seems that's where I have done my fastest marathon. I did that without a watch, uh, and so it shows maybe the, the merits of running free rather than getting hung up on a time. Um, but there's only so many marathons you can run. I, I'd probably do Liverpool more as a just want to soak up the experience this time, um, because like I said, it's great to be running around your hometown. Um, like sort of funny story actually. Sort of, I was running uh, through Cleveland uh, on the third leg of my run, and I see a lady on a, on a bike coming towards me, and she's wearing this canary yellow T-shirt. And I sort of stop her, pushing this pram. And she must have thought, "Good God, what's this?" And I said, "Is that Liverpool Marathon T-shirt?" And she was just like, "Yeah, when it's like 2015 one." She went, "Yeah, when I I run that as well." And she was like, "Oh my God!" So uh, she said, "How did you do?" And I felt a bit bad by going, oh, yeah, I won it. <laughs> um, and like, sort of, I, felt, I felt like a little bit of a big head there. But like, sort of, you know, I, I, wasn't, I, I didn't accost her just to, just to tell her that. It's just so strange to see that shirt there and then. Um, so other marathons I like to look at, you know, I'd like to do a couple of, uh, you know, Berlin, obviously. Um, it's just tricky at the moment. How do you plan for it? You know, I don't even know if these races are doing ballots at the moment. Like, is London doing the ballot for next year? Who knows, you know? And then Rotterdam, Frankfurt, one, one of the real speeds to marathons, I think, you know? I've done Rotterdam. It's boring. No. Is it really? I didn't enjoy oh. it. There were a few marathons I didn't enjoy. So, I really... What's your favourite one? Barcelona. Barcelona, such a beautiful horizon. Yeah, it was just from beginning to end, it was like they play Queen, you know, all the, you know, confetti coming down at the start. You go off in four waves. And it yeah. was the atmosphere, um, they have, and I, I don't know, a lot of it is, I think, the nutrition as well. Every mile they have bananas and orange segments and water and that for me worked really well as I was going around yeah. um, and it's each for you know, everyone's got their own way with marathons but it just the setup was just perfect for me and 
yeah, that has to be. So if you haven't done Barcelona, do Barcelona. On the list, be on the list. <laughs> I did. I did do Seattle last year, so I've come close to experiencing your America adventure. But That's another, cool. That was hilly, but I tell you, I loved every bit of it. I literally, when you're coming down a hill and like your back, you know, you're like this going down the hill. <laughs> was just our uh, experience so i do a little bit sore on the quads yeah i'm not a hill runner i can though. handle seattle i reckon yeah but i do i do hill sessions for my running group that i do but uh, I, I absolutely hate hills but i like to challenge <laughs> have you done beachy head marathon i haven't no i've done no. i've done brighton that's the closest i've yeah. got I've done Brighton, but Beachy Head, please, Rob, put that on your list. It is one of the toughest marathons I've ever done. You, you know, you're not selling it. <laughs> when no, I'm saying I'm trying to go and get I'm the PB. Uh, I think you have to experience the sisters, and you have the start, you, you, you go up a hill straight away, and everyone more or less walks the hill. It's that steep. The Cheers, oh, organizers. That's what we want. Yeah. One minute, <laughs> I'll put you off running for life. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like good training for Barkley. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, what is obviously you've got the COVID and everything at the moment. What have you been doing with your time? You know, have you thought, oh, I'll, I'll get more into my yoga? Have you still been going out for short runs? How have you managed the last six, seven months? Yeah, I've just been keeping things ticking over. Like, so I've not been doing big miles or anything like that, you know. So then, um, I'm sort of just starting to think about maybe moving into some sort of a training cycle now to, to you know, sort of prepare for whatever might happen in the next few months. But yeah, as I said, like, so I was doing a bit of yoga. I actually got a turbo trainer during lockdown. And so um, I was sort of starting to do a little bit more the old cycling things i'm not i'm just not a big one for cycling on the roads i just can't be well i, I can't be bothered i'm risk averse these days in terms of traffic after having a few uh, near misses on on the roads in the states and uh, you know i can't really be bothered stopping at traffic lights i quite like the old turbo training as i said i'm, I'm great with sort of on a treadmill and then um, I think I just need to get myself a little bit of a pain cave with a, you know, put the turbo, get myself a treadmill, and then I can maybe do some of that hill training. You can send me some of your hill workouts, and I'll get on the treadmill and do that. There ain't many hills in Liverpool. <laughs> definitely, definitely. But you have got nice routes in Liverpool, so. <laughs> yeah, exactly. As I say, um, that's why I really do like the Liverpool Marathon, because it's one of these ones that genuinely does make the effort to to get you to see like sort of you know the cool things you want to see in the city like so if you were a tourist and you only had one day to spend in liverpool you know so if you can run a bit i would recommend just doing the marathon it'll tick everything off the box true see you've sold it you've sold liverpool marathon <laughs> <laughs> i have to go back now I only <laughs> to go next back. year <laughs> definitely <laughs> so rob we need to know are you a park runner I am indeed. Yeah, my local park run is Croxteth Park. I've done it, done a good few of us. I've done a little bit of tourism. Um, I actually didn't get to do a single one when I was in the states. The uh, my arrival in any of the few cities that have them because it's it's just not really a thing over there. Um, it was never on a sort of Saturday morning. But you know, I've I've done ones in Dublin. I've done ones in uh, in in Adelaide in Australia, and so and a few few around the UK. So, uh, but, but Croxford Park, which is an absolutely lovely one. If anyone's a bit of a tourist, I really recommend Croxford Park one. And there's a there's a cafe right by the finish as well. Have you ever been to Bushy, the home of Park Run? I should do, shouldn't I? You know, sort of. Um, I, I sort of. Uh, I don't know how they're going to manage the uh, the phased return. Like, so I think that you have to book a slot, and it'd be like sort of six thirty on a Saturday night. You know, um, I, I think I think if I did bushy, uh, it, it's quite often like sort of. Uh, I probably only do maybe I, as I work weekends quite a bit, and so and I've also my, my other half works weekends, so I don't tend to get to as many as I would like to. 
So probably once a month if I'm lucky, and then maybe three times a year I'll try and do like a quick one. If I was do, if I went to Bushy, I would make that one of the quick ones just because uh, I know how many good runners that there are there, and I think it'd be pretty good to get dragged along. Well, my local park run is Northampton Park Run. So, Rob, you have to come to Northampton, please, because we're also like a PB. We're tarmac. We're one big loop and then one small loop. And we have, di you know, diversity. We have wheelchair users, um, visually impaired, deaf runners. You know, we're open to all, like most park runs. But, uh, that sounds please, awesome. Please, we'd love to have you at Northampton Park Run when we're back up and back to normal, so to speak. Yeah, hopefully a nice spring return, maybe a spring bank holiday and we'll all be back on our respective uh, 5k loops. Yes, yeah, I'm so pleased that you have a park run barcode. You don't know how happy I am, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah so the one thing is I'm, I'm a swine for forgetting my, I, I should have had my 50 by now, uh, but I'm a swine for actually forgetting the barcode um, and so I, I was quite successful when I managed to stick it in my phone case uh, because then I'd remember to have everything with me, but quite often I'd just turn up there. They'd actually be one of the ones where I'd try and win because then I could just say, you know, that, that you, they probably make the effort to uh, register your time on a guest one sort of if you've won it. So. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever volunteered at Park Run, Rob? Now, come on, truth now. No, I haven't actually. Uh, this is, the, the one thing is, like the crux of the part one, so the, their their team of volunteers is just so incredible. Like so they've a Chris and Tony Baker lead a great crew, and um, I, you know, so I don't really think they have much need for them. Really, you know, it's, it's a, it, just as I imagine a lot of park runs are. It's just very much one big family, and. Uh, and certainly, if I was asked and I was free, I'd be up for doing that. You know, maybe it is if I ever get injured, touch wood, that doesn't happen. Um, no, that, that, that should be how I should spend my Saturday mornings. <laughs> you are definitely coming to Northampton Park Run. I'm not letting you get away. <laughs> so, so, Rob, anyone that's just about to start running, what best tips can you give? So the best tip I would give is regardless of uh, how good or bad you think you are, uh, most, most new runners usually think they're very bad, um, if you set yourself the goal of doing it three times a week, even if you think that one of your runs was complete junk and you shouldn't have bothered doing it because you ended up walking most of it, you need to do that for at least four or five weeks because it's only after that that your body will start to go, is this what we're doing? And yeah, all right, because you, you'll do it for the first couple of runs and you think, oh, this is all right, isn't it? The third one, you'll probably be a bit tired and you'll just go, oh, I actually am rubbish at this. Then the second week, your motivation might dip a bit and because you're still tired, then you're definitely rubbish at it. And a lot of people will jack it in on the third week because they're just going, I just don't understand what anybody gets from this. But it's just, it just weird. You probably won't even notice it until midway through a run on your fifth or sixth week. And you just go, hang on, this is all right, this, you know. And then uh, you'll realize that you, the, the last four runs that you've hated are not going to be the way forward in the future. So just please persist. Listen to me. I'll bet you. I'll, I'll bet you a cake at, at a park run of your choice that you will enjoy it if you stick with it properly. So one thing I really want to know is, what is your must-have treat after your big races or runs? I usually straight to the pub. <laughs> That's for me. Like, you know, uh, certainly on the America run, like, you know, 422 days, I definitely had 422 beers sort of during the course of that run. And then obviously some days were multiple, some days I wasn't there, but... I think I had a, a beer frog brewed in every state, um, apart from Wyoming, which I narrowly missed out on. Um, and um, donuts as well. Yeah, donuts are a big thing. And if I'm really struggling, you know, sort of, uh, obviously, a can of the old Red Bull sort me out. Oh, okay. okay. With that note, we'll end it there. So thanks, Rob, for sharing your running tell. <laughs> thanks very much. Uh,